It is my great privilege and honor to introduce Lori. Lori Gerson graduated from Barnard College in New York, and she worked for many years in the field of Holocaust education in the United States. Um, after she moved to Israel, she joined Yad Vashem as a guide for educational groups in the museum. And since 2016, Lori has taken on the role of educational coordinator in Yad Vashem's overseas training and education department, where she lectures, coordinates seminars, develops curriculum, and guides educators in best practices. So without further ado, I give you Lori Gerson. Oops, here we go. Okay, I am just getting my presentation here set up. Um, oops, let's go back to the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, let me go out, that will be easier. Go to the beginning. <laughs> First of all, I'll just say it's never, can everybody hear me? Yeah, never easy to follow Cheryl, so. <laughs> but I'll do my best here. Um, let me get the presentation set up and we'll be ready to go. Okay, we all good there with the presentation? Um, okay, so here you see the title is Spiritual and Armed Resistance During the Holocaust. So certain, some of what I'm going to say is going to overlap with uh, some of what Cheryl shared with us today, but it was the perfect introduction to what um, I'm going to be discussing with you. Now, especially when it comes to spiritual resistance, I just want to say that it's one of my favorite things to give over when speaking especially to educators. Because when we think about being an educator in a classroom and what we give over when we teach, what do we want to give over to our students? And when we think of the Holocaust, the Holocaust was a time for, when we take a look at what happened, it was a time when the world seemed to be completely devoid of all basic human values. And when we look at this topic of spiritual resistance, we see that it wasn't completely devoid in the least of it, and that um, there are values that we can give over by teaching this topic, values like community, values like sharing, helping others, and the topic specifically of spiritual resistance um, is where we can do that. So I'm happy to be with uh, educators today sharing that. The other thing is one of the things that many of us say at Yad Vashem is that people many times ask us, isn't it depressing to do what you do to work at Yad Vashem? And of course, uh, every now and then, you know, when we think about what we're doing, of course it is. But one of the things that we like to say is that, especially when dealing with educators, we're not um, how the Jews died, the fact that they were shooting pets, the fact that a million point whatever Jews were killed in Auschwitz, that's not what we want to give over in the classroom. We want to give over how the Jews lived while the Holocaust was taking place, while they were under German occupation, while they found themselves in the ghettos and the camps. And um, so that's going to be our focus of our uh, discussion with the spiritual resistance. That's what we're going to start with. Hi, Lori. Sorry to interrupt, but we're yeah. getting some weird echo from your microphone. I don't know if you can check the connection or maybe move closer to it. Is that better? Is that better or no? A little bit. There's just okay. a weird echo. Let me try this. Can you hear me now? When I speak? Is yeah. That is that better? Yeah, a little, yeah. Is that, you can hear, yeah, it's better? Yeah. <laughs> Is the echo still there? Yeah, it's a weird echo that we weren't hearing before, but. Mm, um, I don't know. It, Lori, it's, yeah. I can give one recommendation if you, mm -hmm. second, if you go to the microphone on the bottom left and click the little mm -hmm. arrow. Okay, I'm gonna plug this back in and see if that works. Okay, if I go, yeah. And you see audio settings on the bottom. Mm -hmm. If you go to audio settings, it should bring you to the this like main menu and on the yeah. right hand mm -hmm. corner is advanced. Okay. Click advanced and it should, you should see a thing called echo cancellation, but mm -hmm. if it's not already selected. There it's on auto, should I do aggressive? <laughs> so, yeah. Let's try that. And then you should be good. And just okay. Is that, is that better? Any better? 
Oh, fantastic. That sounds a lot better. Oh, thank you. Okay. You learn something new every day. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, so to start our discussion today of resistance, I'm actually bringing you uh, to Jerusalem. I'm bringing you to Yad Vashem. And you see that we have here this memorial uh, that's dedicated to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. And you'll see that we have these two different, um, I guess, sculptures here. And you'll notice that they're different. They're made out of the same material, but you'll notice that they're very different from each other. And notice that they're also next to each other side by side. And I'm gonna take you now, so you can see close up the two different, we're in the two different um, sculptures closer. Now, if you look, the sculpture on the left is dedicated to the fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto, the armed resistance. And I just want to point out, first of all, you'll see the sculpture itself. It's very 3D, very dramatic. You'll see that flames here, the ghetto was set on fire during the revolt. I'm going to go like this here. You can see a close up. When you look at the sculpture itself, you see how um, the, the Jews, these youth leaders who were the active participants in the uprising, they're depicted in the way that reminds us almost of Greek gods. You see that? And you notice that they're, on the one hand, they are very emaciated. We can see that, but look at how exaggerated their muscles are. Clearly, they weren't like that after two or almost two and a half years in the Warsaw Ghetto. But that's the image we have of them as these Greek gods. This person here, first of all, based on what Cheryl just told us, there's only one woman depicted in the sculpture. And maybe now, knowing what we do now, that would be done differently today if the sculpture were done today. Um, but we see here, this is supposed to represent Mordechai and Elevitz, who was one of the leader, one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And again, you'll see this picture of he's bandaged, his clothes are torn, and yet he still has in his other hand a grenade. This is a true depiction of bravery and strength. And as we turn to the other sculpture that we have, when we talk about the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, this is called the Last March. And it's meant to represent the almost 300,000 Jews that were taken out of the Warsaw Ghetto during what's called the Great Deportation um, from three months from July to October roughly of 1942. And these Jews were taken and they were sent to the extermination camp of Treblinka. Notice that in this sculpture, the people, first of all, there's a multitude of people, we, we get that impression. It's a much more muted sculpture. It's not nearly as 3D. And um, we see that it's people who are bowed over, seemingly sort of um, already bearing the weight of, of what they're going through. And so a lot of people see this as the Jews that went to their deaths. And they, they, they were the Jews, but I, I do want to point out some things to you here that will definitely come up in our discussion when we talk about spiritual resistance. Who do we have here? I just want to point out a few of the characters. We see here a pregnant woman Okay, so we think about the conditions in the ghetto and how horrible they were. Here we have a woman who still has hope, who still has faith in humanity and the world, and she's willing to bring new life into what would seem to us to be a hopeless world. Here we have a rabbi, an, old, an elderly Jew, and you see that what he's carrying, this is a Torah. A Torah is... Um, the, 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 the Old Testament, and it's how the Jews read the Old Testament when they go to synagogue, and it's a very, it is the Jewish symbol, and you see how he's, he's carrying it. He is still upholding that Torah, even though his Jewishness is what's causing all of his suffering. Um, I want to point out this man, here, here you have somebody just crying out in anguish, very human feeling. Here, we have what seems to be not an old man, not terribly young, somebody who looks to be like a young adult. Look at how he does exude um, a, a little bit of strength in his, you, you can see his, he doesn't look so emaciated. And yet he's in this multitude of people and he's protecting a younger child. And so what I wanna point out to you here is that what we have here is instead of seeing it as the Jews that went to their 
death. So we just have to see this is the other side of resistance that one of the sculptures talks, shows here the, the uh, armed resistance. And this one here is showing us the other resistance, the spiritual resistance. And you have to look for it more carefully. You have to look harder to find it. So that's what we're gonna do now in our discussion. We're gonna talk about this idea of spiritual resistance first. And then we will also talk about armed resistance and how the two, uh, like Cheryl said, and we saw in the video that she saw, that she showed very much were intertwined sometimes, okay? Now, just to remind us of how horrible the ghettos were, and Cheryl already showed the video that you saw um, from the video toolbox, and it's interesting. I have a few clips from that video toolbox too, but I, I chose different ones, so Cheryl and I planned well. Um, but again, just to remind you how overcrowded the Warsaw ghetto was. Cheryl told you seven to eight or nine people in a room. Here's another visual that you can have. This is a map of Warsaw, and you see this is Warsaw. 30% of Warsaw was Jewish, 300,000 Jews lived there. And when they made the ghetto that they were giving to the Jews, they put them in this little area here. That area was the last sensibly percent of the ghetto. They took 30% of the population and moved it into an area that was less than 3%. Oops, did I, oh, I did not mean to do that, sorry. I apologize. Um, Okay, there we go. Um, and not only that, they didn't stop at that. Look what they did then. They then brought another 150,000 Jews from neighboring villages and they also put them in the Warsaw Ghetto. So not only do we have that extreme overcrowding that Cheryl mentioned, nearly 500,000 Jews in this teeny, teeny area. If you think about it also, we have refugees. We have Jews that were brought in from other places that maybe didn't know the street so well. They didn't know how the Warsaw Jews function. So we have that as well and we have to keep that in mind. And of course, there is no shortage of pictures that show how extremely overcrowded the ghetto was. Okay, so that's just a reminder of how bad it was. And again, we can do the same thing with the Lodge ghetto, right? The Lodge ghetto it was her completely sealed. It was hermetically sealed. It was virtually impossible or impossible to get food other than what the Germans gave them. They got an average of eight to 10 people lived in each room. 63% of the homes did not have bathrooms. Bread was distributed once every five to eight days. Less than 2% of the homes were connected to cooking gas. 21% of the people there died as a result of starvation and the living conditions. And that number we have to keep in mind would probably be even higher if Jews weren't taken out at certain intervals to, um, to be killed in the, in, in the camps. Okay, so um, we have to keep this in mind, these are the conditions that are the backdrop for everything that we're talking about today. The Jews were um, severely overcrowded, disease was rampant, they were starving, um, that all of these, they, they were freezing cold. You, you see here, they, uh, they were, weren't connected to cooking it. A gas. It was freezing in Poland during the winter. Um, the keeping wood and getting wood was was um, such a problem in the Lodz ghetto that in January of 1941, the Lodz Chronicle reported that a family woke up in the morning and found themselves in a very strange situation. What was that? That the their their stairs, the banister and the stairs, they were made out of wood and they had been stolen during the night. So they couldn't even get down from their apartment. And that's how desperate the situation was with everything. Okay, many of the ghettos um, had horrible conditions like the ones we're discussing. And so everything we're talking about is, is, is taking place with, with those things going on. Now, I wanna share with you a story here to um, set this, the tone for our discussion of spiritual resistance. And it's a story about a doctor. His name was Dr. Abraham Weinreb. He was in the Vilna ghetto. And this is a picture from the hospital they had in the Vilna ghetto. It's not him in the picture, but I just wanted to point that out. And he survived. And he tells us this story that one point in the, lo in, 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 in the Vilna ghetto, he was in the hospital and they had a group of patients that were suffering from tuber tuberculosis. And at that time, they thought that calcium was the cure for tuberculosis. 
Now, he knew that he had only a limited supply of calcium, and he knew also that no more calcium would be coming into the ghetto. They, they knew that already. So what's his problem? He has this problem of how is he going to distribute the medicine? He has this moral dilemma, right? This allocation of medication, because what are really his two options? What can he do when he has X number of patients who are ill? He can, um, he can decide to give a little bit of medicine to everyone because that way he's not making any decisions and um, he, can, he can be as fair as possible. Or as a physician, he can assess all the patients and he can make a determination on who is the most likely to live, who is the least sick. Why? Because that way maybe as a hope of at least some of them surviving and that those who are closer, who are much further on in the illness and probably won't survive no matter how much medication they, they have, that they, they won't get. Now, of course, it's a very difficult decision to make and he doesn't know what to do. So what he does is he actually assembles um, a committee. He gets a judge, he gets a rabbi, he gets a doctor, and he gets another, and he gets a community leader to be on this committee or he calls them to a meeting and he presents to them his problem. And so these are the answers they give him. The judge says, one may not condemn to death, to death only those who have committed a wrongdoing. So he basically says, I can't tell you because if you only give some medication and not to everybody, you're con really condemning other people's death. The rabbi says only God determines who should live and who should die. I can't tell you what to do. The doctor says, like Dr. Weingrub, I really don't know what you should do. And the community leader says that it's not, it's, 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 it's beyond his area of expertise. This, this is nothing that he can comment on. So Dr. Weingrub doesn't know what to do. So he decides he's going to be as fair as he can. He distributes the calcium to everybody equally. What happens is eventually all the patients die. Now, strangely enough, the same thing happened a few months later. The exact same problem came up with insulin for diabetic patients. Their, 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 their uh, supply of insulin is slowly, slowly shrinking. They have a whole group of patients who are sick with diabetes. And again, he doesn't know what to do. And again, he assembles the same committee together and he presents them the same problem. He says, last time I gave to everybody and they all died. And again, everybody gives him the same answer that they gave before. So this time, Dr. Weingrub says, you know what, I'll do it the other way. I'll give only to those who are the healthiest. And so he does that. And what's the end of the story? They all died anyways, because they did not have enough medicine to fully treat anybody. Now, when we tell the story, first of all, and I some of you already heard this, I guess, from uh, other presentations, we are talking here about what we call a choiceless choice, right? This is that phrase um, where we talk about every decision is a life and death decision, any choice, any outcome, it's, it's a matter of death and sometimes death or just terrible, terrible options. And so Dr. Weiner finds himself with these choiceless choices. And so that this is what he does. But I bring to you the story because I wanna also point out something. When Dr. Weiner asked the question and when he assembled this committee together, let me ask you this question. What do you think everybody involved in this one called scenario? What do you think they all knew deep down inside? They all knew that everybody was going to die anyways. They knew that, right? They knew they didn't have enough medicine. They knew that no, no more medicine was coming in. And yet nobody says that to him. Nobody says, come on, you know, they're all gonna die. What does it matter what we say? They answer him in the proper way that a judge or a rabbi would, would answer him. And so I wanna point out to you here is that what we see here, the spiritual resistance in this story is the asking of the question itself. That is the spiritual resistance. The asking of the question is where Dr. Weinreb, who knows that anyways are all going to die, knows they, that they don't have a chance. He is going to do what he always would have done as a doctor. He's going to consult with other people. And this is where we see this idea of when we think of spiritual resistance, and we're going to see some ideas 
um, some examples, and I'm sure it's what you think of when you think of spiritual resistance, but there's this other prism through which I want you to look at this topic, and that is this clinging to continuity in a world of chaos, where the Jews are always more, the, the world is every day at, at a rate we can't even imagine, their world is falling apart. It's one thing after the other. It's getting worse and worse and worse, and the chaos is building and building, and all the time they're clinging to this continuity. And another way we could say it is they're clinging to their humanity, to their humanity in a world where they're just trying to take away, where their humanity is being taken away from them. Okay, so that's the other way that, that we can say it. And I want you to have that idea in your minds as we go through um, the examples that I'm going to bring. And I brought you examples that A, I think you can either use in the classroom, would be interesting for your students, or examples that I just find um, completely inspiring. And so I'm going to bring you a few examples, only uh, just a little, you know, drop in the bucket. But we're going to start with that and and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, one of the first examples I'm going to bring you of spiritual resistance you might find surprising. Laundry. Okay, so we know that there were great efforts in keeping clean in a lot of the ghettos, but I want to show you something that I found a little bit ago when I was doing some research, and I think this is amazing. I brought you the web site, the page here, and you can see this is from the American Public Health Association. There was an article written in February of 2015, and look at the title, Public Health in the Vilna, in the Vilna Ghetto is a Form of Jewish Resistance, and I want to read to you one of the opening paragraphs that they have. And it says, we describe the system of public health that evolved in the Vilna ghetto as an illustrative example of Jewish innovation and achievement during the Holocaust. Furthermore, we argue that by cultivating a sophisticated system of public health, the ghetto inmates enacted a powerful form of Jewish resistance to directly thwarting the intention of the Nazis to eliminate the inhabitants by starvation, epidemic, and exposure. In doing so, we aim to highlight applicable lessons for the broader public health literature. We hope that this unique story may gain its rightful place in the history of public health as an insightful case study of creative and progressive solutions to universal health problems in one of the most challenging environments imaginable. So what are they saying? They're saying if there's a place in the world where they're really challenged with their public health issues, where should they go? Where should they find ideas and inspiration from the Jews in the Vilna ghetto? It's an excellent article. Look it up. You should all read it. Really, really, really fascinating. Um, but you see here also, I love the way they say the power form of Jewish resistance directly thwarting the intention of the Nazis to eliminate the Jews by starvation. And we see here that fighting back against the Nazis, the Germans and their intentions does not always have to be, as we say, with a gun and a bullet. Here, they're simply doing it by things like things with laundry and cleanliness. Okay, so I thought that that was, and I also just want to point out, this is not the only example I'm bringing you of um, the Jews in the ghettos as trailblazers, as innovators. We're going to see another example of that as well. Okay. Um, now, what I'm bringing you here, they, I'm, I'm going to turn it over. You see the original Yiddish, and I wanted you to see that, but I'm going to quickly flip them to English. These are posters that also come from the Vilna ghetto. The, we have... Um, a very, very nice unit on the Yepeshem website about the Vilna posters and using them to teach the idea of spiritual resistance. So you can find that on the Yepeshem website. Now these these posters were found right after the liberation of the Vilna ghetto. They were literally blowing in the wind and they were gathered. And the posters, we use them to um, give us a clue as to what the lives of the Jews in the Vilna ghetto were and the things that they were struggling with and how they lived under German occupation. So I'm gonna share some of them with you in um, today. So first I'm gonna show you concerts and performances. And it's one of the things that probably we naturally think of when we think of spiritual resistance, that they're going to keep up their spirits by going to plays and performing them in spite of their horrible conditions. What's interesting is that we also have from the Vilna ghetto, um, we have some of the newspapers. They also survived. And you'll see here, this is one of the newspapers. And it says on the occasion of the one year anniversary of ghetto theater. Okay, so this is January of 1943. They've already had these theaters in Vilna um, and, and, and they've already been active for about a year. And when they get to that point, they reflect on 
believe it or not, the arguments they had about establishing the Vilna theater. They had arguments. So let's see what they were. I brought just a few of the quotes here. Somebody said when they were discussing making these, whether or not they should have these theaters, I wish to take this opportunity to express certain opinions for and against the theater. Critics say, theater, this is entertainment. And in the ghetto, there is no place for entertainment. And I also want to remind everybody here, and Cheryl mentioned this in her presentation and in her discussion, and that when we talk about the Vilna ghetto, which was in the area that was first, um, um, that it was first under Soviet occupation, that when the Germans came in with Operation Barbarossa, when they, they invaded and they, that's when they began killing the Jews en masse. And that's when the uh, shooting pits uh, were first, um, first began. And so the Vilna ghetto, and I think Cheryl mentioned this, was established in the shadow of tens of thousands of Jews being killed. Unlike the Warsaw ghetto and the Lodge ghetto that were established um, before, earlier, and of course Jews died from the conditions, but the mass murder of the Jews wasn't taking place yet when those ghettos were established. But in the Vilna ghetto, people, thousands, tens of thousands of the Jews were gone already. And so when you see this next quote, he says, before the first concert, it was said that concerts should not be conducted in a cemetery. And what they're saying is, doesn't it seem grotesque almost, right, that we're having these theaters going on when we know that, that, that the Jews are being murdered en masse or that conditions are are so bad. Now look how they continue. They say this is true, but now life itself is a cemetery. What they're saying is our life, our reality here is completely different. So we don't, we, we have to adjust a little bit. It's forbidden to be weak. We must be strong in our spirit and our bodies. And I'm convinced that the Jewish life being developed here, the Jewish fire burning in our hearts will redeem us from these troubles. So they do establish the theaters. And I also just wanna show you this. One visitor says a theater is a refuge for people who wish to flee their homes, flee reality. This is true also for us. People want to forget what is going on at home. If it works out, they can even forget where they are for several hours. And that is to the credit of all the actors, illustrators, etc., who are capable of providing this refuge. Now we think about it. We talk about continuity and clinging to your humanity when it's being taken away from you. Actors wanted to continue to act. And people that had gone to performances and, and, and um, shows before wanted to continue doing that. And we see that it, it, it does lift their spirits. And sometimes it's, that's what they needed to survive another day. I also want to point out something else. When we, and, and you mentioned music, Cheryl. So this is... Um, this is in connection with that. Tamara Machado is um, in, a musicologist that comes and she speaks at Yad Vashem. And I learned from her something very interesting. If you think about it, and the Jews had such limited resources in the ghettos, but some of them are, are, are buying tickets to go see these plays. And think about them going to these shows. Now, when you have a ticket to a show and you give it to the usher, where does the usher take you to? He takes you to your seat. Now, we mentioned there were seven or eight people living in each room. We saw the Warsaw Ghetto and how crowded the streets were. It didn't matter if you were inside or outside. You were, you, were, you were just all the time surrounded by people. Imagine somebody living in those conditions, what having their own seat in their own space, even just for an hour or an hour and a half, imagine what that did for them. Okay, so we see even a, a, another reason that the theater provided this um, refuge for the Jews in the ghettos. And what I did was I brought you here. Oh, here we go. We see that. I brought you some photographs of these plays. These are in the Warsaw Ghetto, and all of these are on the Yad Vashem website in our um, digital photograph collections. You can find them there. Here is in the Vilna Ghetto a play taking place. Here's the, the outside the theater in the Warsaw Ghetto. This is the children's play being put on in the Lodge Ghetto. And here, I love this. This is in the Lodge Ghetto. This is um, a concert that took place, a symphony. And I just love it because look at their, what they're wearing. Look at their costumes. I mean, to, even to what they were wearing, they wanted to continue doing it as they had before. So I really love that picture. And here's something interesting that I, and I discovered it when I was doing some, some research. And I just thought it was so fascinating that in the Vilna ghetto, 
the last play that they did before the liquidation, of course, they didn't know it would be the last play that they were doing. And what were they planning as the next play they were doing? Fiddler on the Roof. So they never got a chance to do that. But what was the last play they did? And it's a it was a play in Yiddish called Der Flood, like the flood. And what's interesting is that if you see here, these are advertisements for the movie from America that was called The Sin Flood. And then it was later remade as The Way of All Men. It originally appeared as a silent film in 1922 and then a speaking film in 1930. And this is a play, it, it's a movie, it's a play that takes place in a saloon, a bar in America. And it's about a flood that's coming and there's a group of people in this saloon and they're stuck there with the waters building up outside. And this is what, what the play is about. So first of all, I think it's fascinating that in the Vilna ghetto, they were putting on a play about a saloon in America Okay, so we wanted to share that with you. And when we think about it, while it seems so strange, if we think about people um, locked into a room with the waters building up and threatening to drown them, then we very much see how this play spoke to the Jews in the Vilna ghetto. Okay, so I thought that was just very, very interesting and I want to share that with you. Now, as we move on for other examples, we do have to talk about education. When we talked about the youth groups, they were a part of that um, topic of education, and I'm, and I'm going to get to that as well. But um, we know that there were many efforts in many of the ghettos to provide education for the students, and most of the time it was illegal. Every now and then there were ghettos where sometimes they allowed some schools, but many, many times the, uh, the, the teaching of young students was illegal and still we see what we call underground schools, literally underground schools. So just like we have underground fighters, we have underground students. Oh, and here's the Yiddish, I'm gonna switch it over to the English so you can see. Now look what it says. This is again, these are from the posters in the Vilna Ghetto unit that we have, attention young people. They have these classes, you can see physics, chemistry, literature, things that might seem not necessary to learn in the ghetto, but still things that teachers, educators like to teach their students. Look at also what time the classes are taking place. This is at night, 7.30 at night, seven o'clock, 7.30. And why are they at night? Because these students are at their jobs all day long. The, that's very much a part of the way of life is working so you can get a little more food, you can get a little bit of money to buy something if you need. All of these students are working during the day. And so they have to have these classes at night. When we talk about education, I do want you to hear from the words of some of the students themselves. And you mentioned tonight. So here are other diary. These are excerpts from other diaries that we have. Um, one of them, a uh, 14-year-old, Yitzhak Lubashevsky, he did not survive. He was killed, as Cheryl mentioned, in the, in the Ponar, in the shootings in the Ponar Forest. And listen to what he writes in his diary about the classes and education. He writes, for me, the drive to learn was a rebellion against the present. And he uses that word at the tender age of 14. Okay, I was determined to live in the future and not the present. And if we're talking about education and we'll talk about it with these groups and I'm talking to, to educators, we know education is the key to the future. We are educating our students with morals, with values, with knowledge, so they will become functioning adults and we will live in a world that we will we believe will be a better place. So he, at the age of 14, sees that. He says, I was determined to live in the future, not the present. And he's doing that by getting education wherever he can. If of 100 children in the ghetto my age, 10 could learn, I had to be among them to take advantage of this opportunity. Okay, and now I want to bring you another quote here from David Cherkoviak from the Lodge Ghetto. And in fact, he is in the Echoes and Reflections unit that we have on the ghettos and we have a whole student handout where this ex excerpt comes from and where there's um, a lot of quotes from his diary. And this is what he says about going to school and I think that you will appreciate it and if the students are still listening, listen to what he says. Tomorrow is the first day of school, who knows how our school has been. My friends are going there tomorrow while I have to stay home. I have to. My parents say that they're not going to lose me yet. His parents were afraid if he went to school, what happened? And he says, oh, my dear school, damn the times when I complained about getting up in the morning and about tests. If only I could have them back. Okay, so this is something very powerful that you can use with your students 
in the classroom. Um, and I want to share with you this little video clip. It does also come from uh, the our, our video toolbox. Um, and I want to share this clip with you. So here we go. We really had a very a very limited space, not only the actual living space, but actually also the limited outside space. And that ghetto was keeping to keeping us very much together in, in, in a way that it brought us together as well. We would try to establish semblance of a social life, semblance of an intellectual life, for example, there were no schools and my younger sister was very young and I knew that she needed education. So I established a clandestine school and the girls would come to my room. I can't call it an apartment. And they would be in groups of five or sixes and they would come every hour on the hour and we would, uh, I would conduct classes with them and I would spill out of my head whatever I remembered having learned in my school and the most incongruous subject matters. I would teach them Latin vocabulary. I would teach them geography. I would, I would, I would teach them anything I knew. And I, as a matter of fact, I, I wrote an essay which I call Gone with a Dream uh, because one of the things that I read most recently, when prior to establishing the school, was the Polish translation of Gone with the Wind. And uh, when the girls came and they were so solemn and they were so sorrowful and they would say, please, please tell us a story. Uh, I would say, okay, today I'm going to tell you to an all, take you to an altogether different world. And I took them away to a southern plantation in Georgia. And I was talking to them about uh, Tara and about Melanie and about uh, um, Scarlett and, and, and Brett Butler. And uh, uh, their eyes would open and they would dream about it. And I remember one girl especially green-eyed girl who, who, who would, I would have thought would have looked just like Scarlett. I said, goodbye, Scarlett. And she would say, no, I'd rather be Melanie. So we were dreaming together. Okay, now, um, first of all, I want to point out that what is she sharing with them? She's sharing with them Gone with the Wind, which, again, a uh, story that takes place in the south of America, of, 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 United States, and she shared with them a book that at that time is an international bestseller. And it was Cheryl who mentioned the isolation of the Jews in the ghettos, right? That they were isolated from other Jewish communities and certainly isolated from the rest of the world. And we see here, not only is she trying to educate them, but what is she, she doing? She's trying to connect them with what she knows people in the world around them, people in the world around them are involved in. She's keeping them, so to speak, updated with, with, with the latest trends. And the latest trend in books at the time was Gone with the Wind. Um, so, so I wanted to share that with you. And again, when we saw that they were doing that movie, uh, that play with the sin flood, and they were reading Gone with the Wind, I also want everybody to understand sometimes when people think of the Jews in Europe, they have this image of the past, the Jews that lived on farms, and they were very religious, and they um, were very sometimes poor, and uh, they lived in their own little communities. But there are lots of different kinds of Jews. We had some of those Jews, but we also had some very educated Jews. Jews, you could see, were very worldly, knew what was going on in the world around them. So we also gained that from, from this video. Okay. Now, again, sports, and we go back to the Vilna posters. Look at this. Okay. Here we have a list of um, the sports events that are taking place, a basketball competition. 
1942, in the Vilna Ghetto, there were 28 clubs for gymnastics, boxing, and other sports. There were about, they guesstimate about 1,000 athletes amongst the 20,000 residents who are at this point in the Vilna Ghetto. And again, you think about they're working all day, they're, they're exhausted, but yet they still want the uh, Jews, just like the Jews who acted, the Jews who were athletes wanted to keep up the, those activities. And even more so, I brought you here a picture of this inscription on the wall that was around a sports field in, in the Vilna Ghetto. And the inscription here, it announces a sporting event. And take a look, we, again, we have this excerpt from a diary by um, Rushka Korchak that helps us to understand the significance of this sports arena for the Jews in the Vilna Ghetto. Look what she writes, the ghetto even had a sports field. Workers went to great efforts to create it. If in years to come, one will wish to trace and understand our life in the ghetto and no documentation remains, this field will faithfully testify to the essential vitality and the unbridled spirit of life that dwells within us. Theater, elegant sport, these bring a growing sense of optimism. In spite of it all, we will outlive our enemies and win. So we see what it meant to them. And again, we see that it was a symbol of hope. The fact that they were able to still cling to their humanity in this um, world that was anything but. Okay, and as we're are the students still here? I hope because now I'm going to be talking about some things that we see from children, teenagers who were basically around the same age that the students are right now. In the Theresienstadt ghetto slash camp, it had character characteristics of a ghetto and a camp at the same time. Um, we have some publications that came out from the children in this in Theresienstadt. And what happens was in Theresienstadt, just to give you a little background, in all the other ghettos, the Jews lived in family units, even though they had to switch sometimes multiple families in one room, they did live uh, in family units. In the um, in Theresienstadt, they, they separated the men and women. And at a certain point, they, they took the children and they lived in children's homes and they had counselors. So the children there we see in certain of the homes, they produce publications like magazines. Here I have a part from one of those magazines. It was called Comrade and Comrade sounds, you know, it means what it sounds, comrade, friend. And you see, they talked about life. They wrote many articles about what was li life was like, um, things they had to do, poems, stories. They included artwork. You, you can see here. Here I brought you something called the fun corner. Now, first of all, I think if you take a look at it, to me, it's fascinating what they expected. It's a quiz. They have to take this quiz. What they expected their friends to know. They expected them to know 10 rivers in North America. Now, Tretenstadt was in um, it was outside of Prague in Czechoslovakia, and they expected these students to know 10 rivers in North America. I don't think students in North America can tell you 10 rivers in North America, <laughs> as we talked about learning levels before. Here they have list five well-known operas and their composers. I mean, really, these were truly uh, children that were exposed to culture and art. Now, look at this. Look what they say here on the bottom. Answer honestly without using an atlas. Now I'm gonna say that again. Answer honestly without using an atlas. What are they demanding from their friends who are going to the fun corner and taking this quiz? They are demanding integrity. They're demanding um, moral standards. They're demanding fairness. And they live in a world that is anything but fair. Some of these Children, they aren't even in Theresienstadt with their parents. They've been torn from their schools, torn from their homes, torn from their communities, torn from their friends. They have to go to work every day, right? Life is anything but fair, but what are they demanding from each other? That they be fair, that they be moral, that they maintain, they continue to be the same people they were before any of this happened. Now, along the same lines, I'm gonna um, introduce you to a, a, a truly remarkable young man, and we have lessons on him on the Yad Vashem website. Peter Ginz, tremendously talented. Uh, he'd written a number of sci-fi novels already before he was sent to Therese at the age of 14 alone. 
and he becomes an editor of one of these magazines in his home. It's called Bedem. And Bedem literally means we will lead. And here's some of the artwork he did. He's a tremendous artist. He was interested in science. Truly, truly a very, very talented young man who unfortunately um, was killed in Auschwitz eventually. But we do have from him uh, a lot of his writings and his artwork. And here is the cover of one of the Veda magazines that he illustrated. And it's remarkable. If we're talking about spiritual resistance and we're talking about fighting back with something other than a gun, look at what he draws here. This is, his, this is a war scene. It's a battle scene. We have here the cannon, but what's it made out of? It's made out of paper and it's made out of his magazine. And over here, you see the cannons. It's a satire, mirth, and wit. And what he's saying is we're going to fight back with what? With our words. We're going to fight back any way we can. And we see it so clearly here in this illustration. So really, he's a remarkable young man. Um, and you can learn about him on the Epstein web page. Now, we're talking about documentation. So diaries, notes, letters that people wrote, they really have a special place in learning about the Jews and how they um, negotiated the conditions they were in. There was a woman, her name is Alexandra um, Zapruder, you can see here, and she was the editor of a book where she takes um, uh, sections of diaries that were written by children during the Holocaust. And in her introduction, she writes this, perhaps most important of all, they, the diaries, stand as markers of people in time, those who wrote themselves into existence when the world was trying to erase their presence. It's, she says here, as such, they are tools for, for pedagogy to be sure, but they are also a reminder of the singular power of the written word. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, and, um, and, 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 and think about some of these, these were 10, 11, 12 year olds, teenagers that were writing these diaries, leaving their thoughts behind, um, and also as, as a way for them to cope with what was going on around them. Now, I know that Cheryl mentioned the Onik Shabbat archives, Emmanuel Ringelblum, he was the one who, the founder of it, so to speak, he, he organized it, and there were, uh, and it was from the Warsaw Ghetto, and there were um, a number of ghettos that had archives, but the most extensive of them all was the Onik Shabbat, and like Cheryl said, we found them in uh, the milk jugs that you saw and crates. There were three different burials, three different places where they were buried, and we only found two of them. There's another one that we haven't found. And I want to talk about academics and research for a minute because that's what he was. He, Emmanuel Ringelblum was a historian. Uh, he was an academic. And so he enlisted, I believe it was 60 colleagues of his on this venture to record what was happening to the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And we have things aside from the pictures they collected and the artwork and all these things we have, the studies they did. Here's a study on the spread of typhus. Here's a study on the uh, difficult medical conditions in the children's orphanages. And here I want to show you something very special. These are the writings of a woman. We don't even have a picture of her. She didn't survive. Her name is Cecilia Slapek. And she was commissioned by Emmanuel Ringelblum to do what? To study women in the world for better. Now, she followed, I think, those 16 women from all different um, types of homes in the worst of ghetto. And I bring it to you again because when we talked about, for example, the laundry and how the Jews sometimes not only were they struggling for survival, but they were at the forefront of what they were doing. Here's a perfect example because women's studies were not around in the 1940s. As far as I could, as far as I could find, the first even women like lecture as a women's study was done in Australia in 1956. And women's studies as a topic in universities in America, uh, the first time we ever see that is in 1969 in Cornell University. So not only were they clinging to what they'd done before, but sometimes we see they were at the top of their game, so to speak. And it's truly remarkable when we remind ourselves of the conditions that they found themselves in. So I wanted to share that with you. And of course we have artwork and this is a watercolor that was done by the girl who produced this um, painting was Nellie Toll. She was 10 years old from Lvov. 
And she was in Poland at the time. And she and her mother eventually ended up in hiding in a room in an apartment by a Christian family for 18 months. They never left the room. They never saw the light of day. They hid in this apartment in this one room. And we can say about Nellie that what was she, the only thing she was armed with were, were her watercolors, her set of watercolors and little pieces of paper. And you can see here, this is just one sample of what she draws. She has multi, many, many pictures like this. This is not obviously what was going on around her. This she had come from the ghetto and they, they, they were taken in by this wonderful family that saved them. But you see here, she's very clearly drawing for herself a world that she hopes to one day rejoin. And she talks about that. She survives. And what's fascinating is she ends up becoming an art therapist because she remembers how art for her was her escape, her therapy. She did some writings along with the paintings. Truly remarkable to study about Nellie Tong. We have, um, at Yad Vashem, we have some of her artwork in our collection. Hi, Lori. Uh, this is your uh, five-minute warning. Okay, I will go really, really quickly, okay? We have humor as an escape, of course. I'm going to show you from Emmanuel Ringelblum's in his diary. So he writes, not long after the Jews had to start wearing the, um, the badges with the Jewish star on it, he writes, he says in his diary, the Jews in the future will want to know the jokes that we told. It's funny that he even thought of that. But really, we have a scene of the news, of coping with the misery, and look what he writes. And it is funny. Nella Wiki, that was one of the main streets in the Jewish Quarter, it looks like Hollywood nowadays, wherever you go, you see a star. Okay? So that was one of the jokes that was going around the Jewish, the Jewish community. The other thing I want to bring up, and I think that this was brought up before, Sarah mentioned it, and we saw it in the video, that we have the Jewish self-help, right? They were involved um, in all the ghettos, almost all of them, and this is from the Warsaw ghetto, especially they, the, the, the Jews, even in the horrible conditions they found themselves in, many of them were able to rally together to, so to, to, so to speak, live a uh, kind of um, to to go forward and to even in those conditions help other people. We have orphanage soup kitchens, and you see house committees, places where the Jews um, took care of each other in these different buildings that they had. Okay. And lastly, when we're talking about spiritual resistance. I want to take you to Auschwitz for a minute. We have sabotage. When we talk about sabotage. We honestly we normally think of armed resistance. We're going to spend a few minutes in armed resistance. I promise we we will do that. We have here Helena Birnbaum. Helena Birnbaum was a teenager alone in Auschwitz. She was assigned to the Canada Commando. The Canada Commando were the Jews that were sorted through the clothing and the items that the Jews left behind when they were killed in Auschwitz. And listen to what she writes that they did. Most often I worked outdoors, tearing up rags or old clothing to make sure they did not get into good things sorted to be sent to Germany by the Nazis. So they were sorting through the bad stuff was the good part and the good stuff was going to go to the Germans. But I usually tore up everything that came to hand, including as well as bad, so, so that the Nazis had as little use for them as possible. Almost all women I worked with did the same, watching to make sure they were not observed by stormtroopers, by the SS. And why? Because what would have happened to these, to these girls, to these women, if they would have been caught, they would have been shot on the spot. So I can't say this is armed resistance. They weren't taking up a gun. They weren't attacking the SS officers. And yet they were involved in stopping the goals of the Nazis. Okay, now, um, in Auschwitz, we're going to spend a few minutes here talking about armed resistance. And Cheryl was talking about women. We have these four women that I want to talk to you about. They were very involved in the, there was an uprising that took place in Auschwitz in October of 1944. We have here Rosa Robota. She was um, a part of the Canada, Com the Canada Commando, just like Helena Birnbaum. These three women over here and another 20 women that they worked with. They worked in a munitions factory. That was their job at Auschwitz. And for months and months and months and months, they would smuggle out teeny, teeny amounts of gunpowder. Really, I mean, in little teeny pieces of the paper, sometimes in matchboxes, whatever they could, teeny, teeny amounts, because there was an underground in, the, in, in Auschwitz. And this was their part they were taking. They, they would give it to Rosa and she would pass it along to the Jews who were the Zunder, the, the Zunder Commando. The Zunder Commando were the Jews that were responsible in working in the crematoria of taking out the bodies. And they were planning an uprising, but they needed weapons. They needed materials. And these, now these women, these four women were caught 
after the revolt, there was a revolt and it happened, like we said, October of 1944. And they even managed to kill, I believe it was three of the SS officers and about nine or 10 were injured but the entire revolt was squashed. About 250 people involved in the revolt were, or 250 of the prisoners were killed in the aftermath of the revolt. And these four women um, were all hanged very publicly just in the last few weeks that Auschwitz even existed. So now we are going into our topic of armed resistance and I will do it very, very quickly, but we do have just a few stories that we know about of armed resistance in the camps. There was Auschwitz, like we saw, and here's the ruins of the crematory that were bombed during the, the Thunder Commando revolt. And here we have um, in Treblinka, there was an uprising. In Sobibor, there was an uprising. We do see though, it's, it's important to point out that these uprisings, they happen, I, I will say usually when the Jews realize that their end is near as well, when they realize that they're about to um, be killed, uh, when they get word that the Zinder commander are gonna be wiped out. And we see, it's important to understand that the revolt, especially in the camps, it's really a decision to die. It's just how you were going to die. And much like the armed revolt in the ghettos, the um, Jews, they know they're not going to survive these revolts, but the um, spiritual, um, shall we say, mission that they have so that, to, that Jews, just to know that Jews fought back, uh, becomes even stronger. And we see that they rise up to revolt because they want to die. Um, they want to go down fighting. They don't want to go down as victims. Okay, so we see that Colleen came to their, their humanity. When we look at the armed persons in the ghettos, this is the dilemma of revolt. Uh, Cheryl discussed this. So you see here, it was the youth groups that were the ones that um, led the, these revolts and she already explained why. And I have here some photographs of the youth groups all over Europe before, before the Holocaust began. And they had these dilemmas and Cheryl discussed most of them already. We see the risk of collective punishment. She talked about that because even if they didn't mind getting killed themselves or at least they thought it was important enough, they had to worry about their families and their communities and their little sisters or grandparents being killed in the wake of what they did. Challenging authority. Uh, they, there, there was a traditional leadership that Nazi set up the Jewish um, council in, in, in all of the ghettos. And many times the the elderly Jews or the older Jews felt if we just go along with what the Germans want us to do, that's the best way of surviving. If we just work for them, we'll survive. If we if we keep uh, problems, if we don't make trouble, that's our best way to survive. Um, and it's the youth that want to go and act. Uh, the dilemma of procuring weapons, which Cheryl talked about, and think also of the dilemma, the, the decisions they had to make, right? The choiceless choices, if they manage to get money. Are they going to use it to buy a pistol or are they going to use it to spend on hiding a Jew, maybe by a Polish farmer? Because many times they had to pay for protection like that. Okay, so real dilemmas that they had to deal with, real problems that they, um, and like we say, real choiceless choices over and over and over again, abandoning one's family. Right, when we saw that sculpture in the beginning, we saw that strong looking man who was holding a young child. Now, maybe he could have run to the forest, but but he stayed back to protect his family. Um, in fact, we mentioned uh, Abba Kovner. You see him here. That's Abba Kovner in this picture. Abba Kovner was really one of the most celebrated underground and partisan fighters that we know from the Holocaust till the day he died, right? Till the day he died, he died. He considered himself the man who abandoned his mother in the ghetto to run to the forest. And he lived with that guilt his whole life. Um, and again, the practical considerations, did they have the strength, they were starving, weapons, they had no military experience, training, Cheryl mentioned that. And lastly, knowledge and understanding that to come to the decision to revolt, you have to not just know what's happening to you, you have to really internalize it and understand it. And we have one survivor and when, that, that I, I want to quote him when people asked him, but, but didn't you know, what did you know? And he said, you know, we knew but we didn't believe, right? Because the reports were so crazy that they had gas chambers, that they had extermination camps because we knew, but we didn't believe. And because we didn't believe, we didn't know. Okay, so just having the knowledge is not enough. You have to really understand what's happening to you. And by the way, once you understand they're killing all of the Jews, this threat of collective punishment 
all of a sudden it's it's less important because if in the end you're all going to, I mean, it's, it, it's hard to have somebody's death on your shoulders, but yet if you're all gonna die anyways, that's um, a little bit um, less of an issue. So you already saw, obviously we know that, that Ava Kovner really understands, he puts this call out and here, you can look this up on your own, um, but I'm going to just show you we have, it's on the Yad Vashem website, and you can see that we have the minutes from a meeting that takes place in the Bialystok ghetto. And the members there are discussing whether or not they should go ahead with a revolt, an armed revolt. And um, he says here that what we decide today, we, we must decide today what to do tomorrow. Okay, so we can either fight or we can try to run to the forest. Um, and somebody answers Mordechai, who was one of the leaders of the revolt. And he says, we are discussing today two ways of dying because even if we run to the forest, we're, we're gonna die anyways. And then they basically answer here, somebody here, here we have Hersch, Herschel Rosenthal. Lauren, your, your presentation has been amazing. And you're like <laughs> me, we get so involved and so excited. But we want to leave, leave some time for questions. For I'm going to wrap it up, right? Now. I'm going to wrap it up in two and minutes. We are now at 11.36 Eastern okay. Daylight Time. I'm going to wrap it up right now. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, and you see here that they, they, they do want to have their moment in the sun. And like Cheryl says, we're fighting for our three lines in history to show that they didn't go like youth to the slaughter. Okay, I mean, like, like, like sheep to the slaughter. And here we have in Warsaw, we have, and here I'm, I'm, I'm ending. This is a clip. You can see it in the, um, in the video toolbox. I'm not going to show it now. There's a little clip from it where it talks about the, um, one of the battles, so to speak, that takes place, a very dramatic battle involving flags, the Polish flag and the, what's now mostly the, the, the Israeli flag that's flying over the Warsaw Ghetto for four full days as the Warsaw Ghetto uprising takes place. And it's very inspiring. Everybody hears about it. When the German Okay, and now I'm going to end right now. And I know Cheryl showed this picture, but I want to discuss it um, for a minute. And look at this woman here. These pictures come from the Stroop report, which were pictures that were taken of the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. And look at this Jewish woman being held up at gunpoint, right? Look at how she's not even holding up her hands, right? With that, I surrender. Her hands are down. Her spine is straight. She's looking straight at the SS officer who is holding a gun to her. Look at that. We can almost see, we really get a sense of pride there. And so what we can say is that when we analyze all of these different um, armed revolts that took place in the ghettos and even in the camps, uh, we can look at this quote by Antik Zuckerman, and I'm going to end with this, where he he um, he says this on the radio in Israel, 25 in the 25 year anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. He says, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. This was a war of less than a thousand people against the mighty army and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in a military school, not the weapons, not the operations, not the tactics. If there's a school to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The really important things were inherent in the force shown by the Jewish youth after years of degradation to rise up against their destroyers and determine what death they would choose Treblinka or Uprising. I don't know if there's a standard to measure that. And so I'm gonna end right now and remind you just when we look at armed resistance and it certainly has a certain place by itself on a shelf that it really is tied into the whole idea of spiritual resistance because there was a very strong spiritual streak, so to speak, to the uprisings. And that uh, we can even say that it was probably the training, these youth, the youth groups that they had in spiritual resistance all throughout the times that they were in the ghettos that gave them that, that understanding that they had to revolt even when they knew it was not for the military um, win that. And so when we talk about the success of these revolts, we have to remember success is judged by what our goals are. And we saw what were their goals, not to go like sheep to the slaughter. They never said, we want to win this war. We want to, we, we, we want to take down all the Germans. They wanted to take down a few if they could. We won't go like sheep to the slaughter and we're fighting for our three lines in history. And they got it. Right, we can tell that most of the Jews that the Jews didn't go like sheep to the slaughter. We can 
we are now they got their three lines in history and we tell their story so with that i end my presentation i'm sorry <laughs> that we have a few less minutes for questions but we still have a good 20 minutes so um, oh, it was excellent thank you and i think not i think i know what you said at the end was very very important about measuring success you know the success because i i know so many of us teach students and they go mm -hmm. well it, you know it didn't work out look at all that effort but right. your statement is excellent and i never thought about it like that so and and by the way when we talk about sometimes teaching the holocaust and talking in terms of pedagogy and lessons that we can pull out Gail, thank you for pointing that out because when we think of the lessons, sometimes the effort may be even more important than the outcome. And we always have to, especially our students, if they struggle, if they have difficulties, if they come from difficult home situations, whatever it is, many times we have to remind our students of that. And here we see that the Holocaust can be used to give over many, many different lessons. Um, that have nothing to do with the one point, you know, with the numbers one, over one million Jews killed in Auschwitz. So, um, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Lori, that actually leads us right into our, our first question that someone sent to me in the chat about pedagogy. Okay. Um, yeah. And the question is, um, what are some common pedagogical issues you encounter when teaching about resistance during the Holocaust to students? And how can we as teachers uh, overcome these issues? Okay, so... Um, well, first of all, when we teach about the Holocaust, there is this general um, kind of feeling that people have that, that why didn't the Jews do more? You know, why or why didn't they do anything? Some people think the Jews didn't do anything and that they could have done more. And I think that when we teach, when we go into depth about the conditions, about their struggles all throughout, and then we teach about, thank you, and then we teach about the... Um, the the uprisings and the different types of resistance um, that um, her students understand that the Jews were doing things the whole time. Maybe they're different than what they think of when they think of resistance, but all the times the Jews were doing and they were trying and they were attempting and that um, very, very much so the Jews in many, many, many ways were active in resisting the conditions they found them in and what the, and, and how the Nazis were making them live, so to speak. So I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, also another question um, you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, uh, actually in various points of the, the presentation, um, resistance in Auschwitz. And somebody asked a question about um, mm -hmm. if Echoes and Reflections or Yad Vashem have any teaching resources about Freddie Hirsch, um, uh, his resistance in Auschwitz, and he was in Treisenstadt as well, um, I believe. He was. Uh, could he you, was. Yeah. Could we you have a lot. We have a lot um, about him. Definitely, I know Cheryl can answer better because she's more familiar even than I am with the Echoes and Reflections uh, units. But definitely, in the Yad Vashem website, we have um, a lot about a lot about Freddie Hirsch. Yeah, really. I mean, I don't have time to go into his story right now, but. He truly, uh, thank you for, for mentioning him because again, he, he is a, he's a symbol of resistance, but it was a different kind of resistance. He was doing as much, he, he, he was in his heart an educator um, and he tried really his best to work with the younger students to make their lives as, 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 as better as they could be under the circumstances and yeah. You should look him up and, and, and study him. And Yad Vashem has a lot of material on him. So I'm going to put my email in the chat because I forgot to put it on my final slide here. And then if anybody um, would like to would like to email me with questions, the other thing I just want to add is certainly if you have questions about books for students to read in the lower grades. Uh, you can email me because that's something that, that I do at Yad Vashem. I work on curriculum for younger students in English. So if that um, is something that you want more information on, feel free to hear. Uh, just type in your email to email me and with what your needs are, and I will share with you whatever I have. Okay, there we go. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Lori. And that actually kind of goes into our, our last question that we have, which is, um, uh, oh, sorry, let me bring it up. Um, so when should we include the topic of resistance when teaching about the Holocaust, especially if we only have five to 10 class sessions to teach the entire history? Um, you know, it's a, it's a really, <laughs> it's a really good question, but I would definitely think, like I said, that, um, that this is actually, I, I believe, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think it's one of the most important topics to teach about the Holocaust, because like I said, it's the place where we can teach values to our students. We can empower them, whether it's armed resistance or spiritual resistance, we can empower them um, with stories of people who found themselves in difficult situations and were able to, to overcome them so they can find them to be inspiring. Now, the truth is that the stories really stand out in the backdrop of how horrible the conditions were and the conditions the Jews found themselves in. So the context, the historical context and the setting that they're in can't be ignored. But I would definitely think somebody said you, you said you had about four or five lessons. So um, it depends what you start with, but if you start and you're discussing, um, I, I guess you're talking about I don't know if it's a history um, course or what the context is, but I would definitely say that it should be included and, but you need to set the stage. So there is historical context. So they know that the Jews were being persecuted. They were being separated. It would have, was happening all over Europe. They many times um, were persecuted not only by the Germans, but by their local neighbors, things like they need to know all of that. So they know the desperation the Jews were in. So that would be an important lesson. And then after that, you can talk about how the Jews reacted to these extreme situations they found them in. And you can pull out these sort of nuggets of inspiration, as we like to refer to them sometimes, where it's the light in the darkness. And that's where we think that our, our, our students will find inspiration and um, really learn the true lessons that we think the human story of the Holocaust and the, and, and the human story of the Jewish victim and how they reacted. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Lori, so much. And I would just like to say that your your presentation fits so well with um, what we learned yesterday from uh, David Silverklein, who talked about mutual assistance during the Holocaust, and it just complemented each other so well. So oh, good. I hope I hope it wasn't too repetitive. <laughs> no, it's a different. It was a different part of the mutual assistance, which was you talked about the you know the spiritual part of it. You know, creating lifting the spirits. Literally, it it uh, it seemed like at times. So thank you. Well, then I'm not taking away your job as queen of chat because you're you've done so great. But Doug emailed me privately. Uh, Doug, would you share with everyone about the New Jersey uh, curriculum uh, and uh, how they address resistance? Because the vast majority of us are from the state of New Jersey. No, we had, there's a whole unit that we have on resistance that was done when they redid the, the curriculum in 2001. We're presently in the process of redoing our curriculum right now. And we'll add a lot of the stuff that was presented today by Cheryl and Lori, which is fabulous information. There's no question about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, live from Trenton, Department of Education. Our boss, our overseers. Thank you so much. And... I am the concluder. I, am I correct that we've done all our questions, Morgan? Yeah, I just want to thank, say thank you, Gail, for having me. I forgot to do that, I believe, in the beginning. And thank you to everyone for joining today. Thank so. you to you. I know you're still, uh, I know you're obviously still with us. And Cheryl is too, because she sent me some messages in the chat. So thank you all. We are honored to be part of Yad Vashem. And we you're part of us, and we feel so much that we're part of you. And um, thank you all. The questions are great. Just a brief review to say you will all receive your PDHs, professional development hours, um, sometime today or early tomorrow. Evaluations are so important to us for our future funding, our future workshops. Stay tuned. We're hoping to repeat 
our Yad Vashem bridge connector next summer again. And we're here to help you. Doug from the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education, Steve Marcus from Dual High School Credit, Raz Siegel Morgan, myself, Master of Arts in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and anything I can do to help you here at Stockton University, I am a faculty admissions ambassador. And we look forward to so many more programs. And I look at, I just have to show off Lori uh, to, to you and Cheryl to say, when I look at our participants, they're all friends. I know almost everybody. Thank you all from all over the world joining us today and especially our partners uh, from New Jersey. Thank you, stay safe, be well. We all are wondering what our fall will be like with our students. We're here to help you once we know what our fall will be like. Take care, our love to everyone. And Morgan and Irvin, please give a big wave because we couldn't have done this without them. They are amazing. And if everybody just put their cameras on for a minute to say goodbye with a wave. I love Mexico, Matt Hone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Be well, and please don't be a stranger. Keep in touch. Bye-bye, everybody.